I'm taking it back eventually. I need all 2,400 square feet apparently now. All right, this is the Tudor Wizard. This is Willa. She's messing with everything in the background as usual, so we're going to put her in the videos. She wants to know how the coronavirus works as well. What we're going to do today is basically we're going to do many, many videos on a series on infectious models and getting them more and more accurate and more and more realistic to what everybody is actually using in all of the other videos on YouTube and online. What we're going to... Okay, okay. She wasn't done. You're making my nose itchy and then I have to keep sniffing. I know, okay, yes. Don't do this at home. There's coronavirus out there. You're probably not supposed to rub each other's faces. Don't do that at home, kids. What we're going to do is this video is going to do a bunch of preliminaries. We may have one or two more of these. We'll see how much time it takes and how many of the details I remember. But in this video, we're going to do all the preparation tools of basic mathematics and basic calculus, basic as I can get it, and all of the functions and calculus of functions that we're going to need to, I'm going to sort of wave a hand at in the other videos when I'm trying to focus on epidemiology. The first thing we're going to do is, one, I'm going to remind you what exponentiation actually means. Bed mass. Why does bed mass work the way that it works? Bed mass. Brackets. I don't know. Brackets. You got bed mass. What is bed mass? Bed mass. Exponents. I just realized as I was doing it, writing vertically is weird. Division. Multiplication. Not writing that one out. Addition. Not writing that one. Subtraction. So you get bed mass with the mnemonics. I don't really like mnemonics, but why does the mnemonic work? Well, first of all, what does it mean? Bra do brackets first, then do exponents. We're going to talk about this guy, and then my brain said, let's talk about this bed mass. And then division and multiplication. And then addition and subtraction. Our monkey brain only knows one binary operation. It's called addition. Subtraction is the negative. B minus A is B plus the negative of A. Addition, see? Subtraction is addition. Multiplication. M times A is A plus A. M times. So, oh, multiplication is adding. Division. 1 over M times A is A divided by M. Multiplication. <laughs> We're multiplying by the reciprocal is division. So, our brain knows addition. Multiplication is a higher order, we call it, or it speeds up the process. Subtraction is the inverse of addition. We've got this one covered. Good. They're the same thing. Multiplication is addition we just saw, and division is just the inverse operation of that. Division is multiplying by reciprocals. So those guys are the same higher order addition. And then exponentiation, which is what we're going to talk about now, is when we have a positive integer. This is A times A N times but multiplication is adding. So exponentiation is also adding too because it's higher order multiplication. So basically what it says is first you do brackets first, which simplify everything and have it organized. You do everything inside the brackets first. And then the rest of the order is because you do highest order addition, then the second highest order addition, then the lowest order addition, which is addition and subtraction. This is why bed mass works the way that it works. Kratz course in arithmetic 101. Now we're going to talk about this one in detail. So one, exponentiation. We're going to let A be a positive number. Why? Because if that exponent eventually becomes a one-half, that's going to end up being a square root. And I don't want to do the square root of negative one because this is going to be an imaginary number, not a real number. So our base is going to be B, the base of exponentiation. This is the crash course. I'm not doing the rigorous definition. Then we have the following demographic of, here's a journey through the types of numbers based on how you actually raise another number, a positive number, to those exponents. How do I do this? One, I have to define what does it mean to multiply two to the three? What does that mean, two to the three? You've been showing, so you know that it probably means two times two times two, which is eight, and usually you just write eight and you never think about it again, or calculator, tell me what that is. What's two to the 10? 
Oh, yeah, I got you. 1024. 2048, 4096, powers of 2. What does that mean? If n, oh, also, there's your crash course. If this means is in, this is the set of all positive integers. So if n is a positive integer, which is, that's my lazy math way of saying n is a positive integer. If n is a positive integer, then a to the exponent n does mean a times a times a n times. And as an example, yes, 2 to the 3 is exactly equal to 2 times 2 times 2 3 times, which is, this is, use the brackets, bed math brackets first, so I associate and I put a bracket and I get 4 times 2, which is, sure enough, 8. Now what if I want to move to uh, the other kinds of integers? The next move we're going to do is the Brahmagupta invents zero as a placeholder. Good. What does it mean to raise a number to the power zero? Two. For zero, we have a to the zero equals one for any positive base a. That now is the natural numbers. Three. How do I do the integers, negative numbers? What does it mean for n is a positive integer? What does a to the negative n mean? Or how do I get a base raised to integers? This is the multiplicative reciprocal of this guy. This is by definition one over a to the n. And then this is one of the rules they tell you that to make the exponent positive, you bring it on the other side of the division sign. And this is, of course, a times a multiplied by itself. I use, I'm rarely going to use the cross sign for multiplication. It's either going to be a dot or just juxtaposition. Putting them together is multiplication. Go to your friends, make a number. This is the integers, or z is in German, it's Zahlen for integers. Die Liebe Gott gemacht, die Zahlen alles anderen is mentioned back. God created the integers, the rest is the work of man. So this is the integers. This is now how to raise a number to an integer. What about the last couple kinds of numbers? I need rational numbers and irrational numbers. There's other kinds of numbers, but for now that completes the real numbers and exponentiating the number to the real. Four, we have to take our first tangent, pun intended. What does it mean to do nth roots? Crash course in this, or radicals. This is our definition. The nth root of a is by definition equal to b if and only if a is b to the n. And what does that mean? The nth root of a number is the number b such that when I multiply b by itself n times, I get exactly a. In particular, the square root of a equals b if and only if a equals b squared. The square root of 2 equals b if and only if 2 equals b times b. We're looking for a number which when I multiply it by itself I get exactly 2. That number happens to be approximately equal to 1.414213 dot 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 dot. Some other video on YouTube there he says it's 1.4. It's like it's got a few other digits. Memorize them. Square roots. What's the most important part with this? You can get rid of this horrible symbol in your mind for the rest of your life. It never has to exist ever again. This is a fractional exponent denominator. Nth roots are the radical rules, exponential rules. There is no new symbol. Uh, the Greeks did this. It's one of the few things. It's like, ah, oh, I wish they had done that. But there's the evolution of this symbol, square root for this. Fractional exponents. And this is how we're going to get at this definition. And this tangent is how we're going to get at a to the m over n because these are going to both be integers and now i know how to deal with this of course n has to be a positive integer in fact greater than two the game's not hard when n is one got it a yes i can play that game all day long want to see it again a so what do i do with this this tells me that if m over n equals r is a rational number these are the rationals we're going to do a video, more than one video, on the different types of numbers and the Matryoshka doll of this story, too. So go watch those. If I have a rational number, what does it mean to raise a to the r, this rational number? 
This means it's a to the m over n. And now we can define that because we defined n roots. We can define this. And here's computation. Both are true, but I would only use the first one. Both are true. This is the nth root of a. Remember, 1 over n is nth root to the power m. I would do that if I was actually computing. You've never done it. But put a 2 in there and try and compute the second root of a hun the hundredth root of 2 to the power 314. This, if I put the m in, okay, I'll write the other one. This also is equal to correctly because I'm using uh, exponent laws, which I, I'm going to write down in a second. This you can write as a to the m. But if this is a horrible 1.414, I don't want to raise it to the power of this and then try and play the square root game, nth root game. Well, if you see these games in the Babylonian approximation or these types of things to find nth roots or square roots, I don't want to power the number to make it big and then play that game. I want to have it play the nth root game and then multiply that number once I have its decimal expansion. I'll multiply it m times. You have a calculator, so you've never even thought of the logistics of these types of problems, but... This one, this is how you compute powers of rational numbers when they're rational. And then now the last exponent I need is the not rational numbers, the irrationals. What does it mean to raise to, let's do that and then I'll show you what it means to, what does it mean to raise two to the square root of two or two to the pi? What does that mean? Two to the two, three means multiplying two by itself three times. Two to the pi means multiply two by itself 3.141592 times. What does that mean to multiply 2 by itself pi times? I don't know either. If Q is irrational, they didn't even give a new symbol for them. They were just, you, you think I maybe for irrationals. No, they're just like the complement of the <laughs> rationals in the real numbers. The other guys, they were irrational. They have an infinite non repeating decimal expansion. So, aside, every rational number. Irrational if and only if you have a repeating decimal expansion, which is infinite. And then we can ask, are there numbers that have a non-repeating infinite decimal expansion? And yes, pi and the root 2 are these types of guys. They definitely exist. What does it mean to do this? We've done so far 2 to the 3. I can compute as 8. I know how to do that. Haha, <laughs> they've shown you. 2 to the 0 is 1. I just showed you that too. You're like, what's 2 to the negative 4? Oh, that's 1 over 16 because I figured out how to do that. It's 1 over 2 to the 4, which is 6. I can compute those now. You can see I just use all the rules. There's a positive integer. There's a 0. There's a integer. And then what am I doing? What does it mean to do 2 to the 1 half? Oh, that's the square root of 2, which I can use an approximation to make 4, 1, 4. Da, da, da. And then now I'm saying, what does it mean to do 2 to the pi? Your calculator will tell you what it is, 8 point something, 8.81. How did it know that? Here's how it knew. What we're going to do is we use successive rational approximation of irrationals. We use the rational numbers to approximate the irrational numbers. So what we're going to say is a to the q is going to be the limit as r approaches q of a to the r, where r is rational. Rational approximation, don't worry about the symbol. I'm going to show you what this means. What do I mean by that? Let's use this guy. Pi, correct to two places. How did they get those two places? That's also another video. Power series, arc 10. Blah, blah, blah. That's not the one I'll use. I'll use a couple of different series to approximate pi. But pi to two places is approximately equal to 3.14, which is 314 over 100. Oh, a rational number. So this says that 2 to the pi is approximately equal to 2 to the 314 over 100, which I'm going to write as the nth root, the hundredth root of 2 to the 314, which is approximately equal to 1.0069 to the 314, which is approximately equal to 8.81. And I must have looked it up. 2 to the pi in your magic calculator actually says it is 8.82 dot dot dot. So this is how we and your calculators just did it to more places, but it just finds a better approximation to pi so then it can have a better approximation to 2 to the pi. This is how we're exponentiating numbers and this is what it means to raise a positive number to another number which is real. There's the demographic. Exponent laws. These aren't just laws or good ideas. They're, axi they're things that we can derive and they're fundamentally true. So 
These are the only moves you're allowed to use. I'm just going to list two because they're the most common ones I'm going to use all of the time. If I have one, A to the N plus M, A is a positive real number, blah, 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 and M and N can be real numbers now because we now know how to raise a positive number to any real exponent. Then this is equal to A to the N times A to the M. Somebody probably said to you and you're like, I just should, I'm sure in my brain, I'm going to just shut that off while you say that for a minute. Sum in the exponent is product and the bases. This guy's called the base. If there's a sum in the exponent up here, you can use brackets. Don't be shy with the exponential function. There's inside outside composition. We're going to do this. Sum in the exponent is multiplication in the bases. It says you can write it as a product. This is extremely useful. We're going to use it in the later videos. And two... I used it for the definition of rational functions already. A to the M times N is A to the M to the N. You can move them away from each other or A to the N to the M. These are the two big exponent laws that I'm going to consistently use. You, get, you use them everywhere. If you're trying to use and manipulate exponents or exponential functions or anything like that, guess what else you're going to use? I don't know. These. There's a couple more. We don't need them for what we're going to do. Next. This one's definitely intended a tangent into calculus. So now what I'm going to do is quickly derive what Sir Isaac Newton is doing at by candlelight. Coincidentally, in 16, I don't know, somebody look it up and subscribe, tell me in the comments below when it was. I think it was 1678. He's hiding from the bubonic plague. He's been told to leave London to go to the farm and self-isolate. In that 16 months of self-isolation, hiding from the bubonic plague, he derives the fundamental theory of light, the fundamental, first fundamental theory of gravity, and the calculus of variations. Let's do one of those things. He's hiding from the coronavirus of the 1600s. Bubonic plague. I don't think you want that. I'll take coronavirus over the bubonic plague any day. Don't give me either. I wasn't advertising for a disease. What is Newton doing as he's hiding from or in self-quarantine? It just made me feel really good as I just came to that conclusion myself that I, several hundred years later, mad is hard. I don't know how many years that is later. <laughs> <laughs> Several hundred years later, I am also in self-isolation deriving what Sir Isaac Newton did <laughs> in the 1600s. <laughs> that is hard. This is what he's doing by candlelight. Coincidentally, in the barn, there was these shapes. Can you do the In the barn doors of where he was. Barrow was his supervisor. He says, if I've seen farther than others, it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants. The giants he's talking about, one of them is Barrow. One of them is Barrow. He's got a function. F, we call it. You're going to see we're going to do this. We're going to try and model. Then what we do with this, and the whole reason we want any of this is we have a function which we get a graph of, and we're going to try and model the behavior of an infection. So we're going to say this is the population of infected people. We want to model that with a function and see what that function is doing over time so we can predict the behavior of the disease. We have a function. What Isaac Newton wants to know is what is the rate of change of that function? Rate of change is going to be what we call the derivative due to Isaac Newton and uh, Leibniz also independently derives this at the, both the same time. What he's saying is at a point A, I have another value on the graph and this will be F of A. And he says, I want to know what the rate of change at that point is. And he says, well, we don't know. Nobody in the species knows. He's going to do it while he's hiding from bubonic plague. Is it bubonic? Yeah. Bubonic. 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 Well, he says, well, I know what the rate of change of a straight line is. We've known quite a bit about rectilinear curves for quite a long time. This is the, what calculus is doing. It's trying to uh, describe curvilinear things through rectilinear things. Curvilinear. Rectilinear. Rect them, hell down there, kill them. This is the change in X, and this is the change in Y. And our slope or the change in that rate of change of that function is change in y over change in x. So then he realizes, oh, well, if I took a point out here, I took a little h value and moved myself out. We've blown up this picture so it's really big. We've zoomed in on your TI-83. We zoomed right in so you can see something and then that's pixelated. I can't tell where the inflection point is. Yeah, don't use your calculator. And then I have another point over here which is f of a plus h. And then I have a secant line. It's a character, it's to cut. So I have this secant line. From that secant line, what we see is I have a slope. 
for us specifically that change is going to be f of a plus h minus f of a over a plus h minus a and the a's cancel a minus a is zero so the slope of that secant line is f of a plus h minus f of a over h and then what the genius of what newton does is he says i'm going to push h to zero as h approaches zero and gets smaller and smaller this point will get closer and closer to this point and then this point is going to move that looks like it did the same one I should have drawn up zoom in more on your TI-83 and then we're going to get here and then eventually we're going to get to the point where I have a line which just touches at one point or kisses it right there and Tangier is to touch so this is the, going to be the tangent line and that's why if you didn't know already why the tangent line we're going to take tangents pun intended is yeah we're looking calculus talks about tangent lines always to curves now the genius of what Newton sees is he knows how to create the instantaneous rate of change of a straight line rise over the slope but now at this point that straight line which has a slope which tells us the change of that straight line is also coinciding with our nonlinear function so the rate of change of this function is equal to the rate of change of the tangent line at that point. And so the slope of the tangent line becomes the instantaneous rate of change of the first of the function, which we call derivative. So what this says is the slope of the tangent line is this limiting process, the limit as h approaches zero of the secant line of f of a plus h minus f of a over h. And this is what Sir Isaac Newton defines to be, and he uses prime for the rate of change. And so we say f prime of a is the slope of the tangent line to the curve at a, which is the instantaneous rate of change of the function. So forevermore, when I say derivative, I mean rate of change. But this is what Sir Isaac Newton is doing. And in Leibniz notation, we should give a shout out. Actually, I like Leibniz much more, and I'm still going to raise what I talk about. We're going to call this df dx, the derivative of f with respect to x. It's not a fraction. It's a linear operator applied to a function. Rate of change. It's rate of change. Three. Let's do that at least once. Let's take a straight line and... No, let's not take a straight line. Let's take x squared. Here's a function. y equals x squared. He's a parabola. This guy. Let's use the definition that Sir Isaac Newton uses to calculate the derivative at 1. So here's the point 1. I get the value 1. What's the equation of that tangent line? This gives me y equals f of x is x squared. So this says that f of 1 is equal to 1 squared, which is 1, f of 1 plus h. I put 1 plus h wherever x is evaluation. So this is 1 plus h squared, which is 1 squared plus 2h plus h squared. This says that the derivative or the instantaneous rate of change of this curve at 1 is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of f of 1 plus h minus f of 1 over h, which is equal to the limit as h approaches 0. The idea is everything on the top, I have to pull h out. I don't want to divide by 0, or lightning will strike me, and I have to, I don't want to do that. So I'm going to get rid of it, and I don't have to dodge lightning. What does that give me? That gives me 1 plus 2h plus h squared minus 1, and then haha, ha, everything with out of h and it cancelled out. Don't do this lazy factor the h out of the top equals the limit and yes you have to write limit every time h approaches zero of 2h plus h squared over h and then I'm going to pull one out I got to write the limit again limit as h approaches zero of it didn't take that long h 2 plus h over h cancel cancel <coughs> now I can push h to zero this gives me 2 plus zero which is 2 the slope of the tangent line, this is going to be 2x plus somebody. Let's find that and build explicitly what the equation of that tangent line is. We now know that the slope of that tangent line is equal to the derivative or the instantaneous rate of change of that function at 1, which is now equal to 2 using Sir Isaac Newton's calculation of the 1600s. We have x is 1, and we saw I recalculated, don't recalculate. 
f of 1 is 1 squared, which is 1. So we have a point, 1, 1. This tells us that y minus 1 equals 2 times x minus 1. This is the equation of the line. Or simplify a little bit, what does that give me? y equals 2x minus 2 plus 1, 2x minus 1. This is the equation of the tangent line to the curve at that point. At 1, they are equal to each other. f and the tangent equal each other. Therefore, the instantaneous rate of change at that point are the same, and they both have the slope 2. This is what Newton is doing with calculus, rates of change. 3. The number of the day, E, not the letter, the number. There's not a mistake, E. I need this number, E. Sesame Street does the number of the day and the letter of the day. We're going to do the number of the day, E. What we're looking for is, first of all, what does it mean to be an exponential function? So the exponential function, we're used to writing y equals f of x. And now we're going to write what kind of functions do we have? Well, in this case, we were considered with, we want to be concerned with the exponential function. What that gives us is, now you can see we did our quick demographic of what that means. X is any real number. Coincidentally, that tells me my domain of my function is all real numbers. The values which we're allowed to put into this function. If A is positive, it's all the real numbers. We want a quick demographic of what that looks like. First of all, we see that if we're going to start trying to sketch this and what it looks like, if A well, there's two cases technically. If 0 is a is less than 1, and that will give us a fraction which acts as a negative exponent, and it will come downwards like this. In this case, this would be a to the x if a is between 0 and 1. So it's a fraction, which is less than 1, because it will give me a negative exponent. And then if a is strictly larger than 1, say 2 or something like this, then you're going to get this a to the x if a is larger than 1. Don't worry about the details. I'm going to make a larger than 1 every time, or you'll see when we do this, this is the one I want, essentially. Our a is going to be e, 2.7, so it's going to be larger than 1. So this is the case we want to focus on. My point being here, though, is what is f of 0? Is a to the 0, which is what? Test number 1. 1. <laughs> so they all pass. What they start noticing is... There's all of these exponential functions pass through the point 0, 1. And now they have Sir Isaac Newton's tool of the calculus of variation and instantaneous rate of change or slopes of tangents at points. And what they ask themselves is, is there a base? We want a base A such that, that's my shorthand for such that, I'm not writing those words out anymore, such that. The slope of the tangent line is exactly equal to 1 at the point 1, 0, 1. At this point, can you find the equation of the tangent line and have that slope exactly equal to 1? Well, we have calculus of variations which we could try to look at and see what happens there. Let's see what that means. F prime of 1, or sorry, 0. X is 0. F prime of 0 is the limit as h approaches 0, which is the, that slope that I'm looking for. And I want that to equal 1. So now what I'm saying was, well, I have kept Newton's way of calculating what that is explicitly. So that is f of 0 plus h minus f of 0 over h, which is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of a to the h minus 1 over h. And I need that to equal 1. definition. E is the real number such that the limit as h approaches 0 of e to the h minus 1 over h equals 1. This is the number that does it. It's got, there's more than one video. E is also equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 over n to the n. And E is also equal to the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of 1 over n factorial. He has other avatars which are much better at computing them. But for right now, for the calculus story, watch some of my other videos. E, this is the definition of E. 
he is the guy, the number which has that limit equal to one. And now let's see why they're looking at that. And then what we're going to do is with this picture, I'm going to draw a couple more. When you actually plot these, they started looking. If I look at A equals 2, we get the tangent line is approximately equal to 0 0.9 something, dot, 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 dot. They calculate by brute force. Hmm. And then when they calculate when A is 3, when they use 3 to the X, they get that M tangent is approximately equal to 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, so there has to be a number E between two and three, strictly larger than two, so its decimal expansion is two point something, which does this. So we now know that E is approximately equal to two point something. It's between two and three, and you can use those other power series or limits to compute what it is. E is, I'll tell you, E is approximately equal to 2.718281828409. Four five nine zero four five. Da, 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 da. It's got a few decimals. Infinite non-repeating. It's an irrational transcendental number. Watch the other videos. What does that tell me now? And what's the consequence of this? So you're like, I, I still don't see what the magic of this is. <laughs> Let's just compute it. It tells us that this function, this number e, gives me a single function e to the x which has its instantaneous rate of change at a point equal to the value of the function at that point. But <laughs> he's his own derivative. It's the only function who's his own derivative. Let's derive that explicitly. As a consequence of this, now watch what happens. If I consider the function y equals e to the x, then the derivative with respect to x of e to the x using Leibniz notation is by definition Still using Newton, I'm going to guess. H approaches zero. I just give a jab at Leibniz. The British did it. The British did it first. This is e to the x plus h. Oh, an exponent law. Minus e to the x over h. I'm going to use an exponent law. A sum in the exponent is a product in the basis, which is equal to the limit as h approaches zero of e to the x times e to the h minus e to the x over h. Oh, I have e to the x in both terms. Factoring 101, take it out. And in fact, it's e to the x. It doesn't even depend on where my limit's going. So this is e to the x times what? The limit as h approaches zero of e to the h minus one over h. That's one. So, but that's the function again. He's his own derivative. This is the only function that does it. He's magical. Every other exponential function, the derivative of this is directly proportional to the original function, and that proportionality constant is log a. It's a number which involves e. This is why e is so important in calculus. The rate of change of all of these other exponential functions are the derivative, don't worry about it, of a to the x is a to the x ln a. The rate of change of this function is directly proportional to itself, and the proportionality constant involves e, because ln a is our lazy way of saying log base e of a, and there he is. He's in the rate of change of every exponential function. So if you're doing finance or spread of infectious diseases or any of these things, we're going to be using E or any exponential function. E's in all of these exponential functions. He is the rate of change of exponential functions in calculus. He's important. Next. Now we have exponential functions. Hopefully you're fairly comfortable with what that means. What does it mean to exponentially grow and exponentially decay. They're going to talk about this a lot in the models, and if you've been watching about this, they keep saying we're hoping that it has exponential growth or exponential decay, or linear growth and linear decay, or what are they saying by this? Parabolic growth. I don't know what that means. That's why the graph is worth a thousand words. That's why we try to plot and get pictures and describe what's happening, because we can't see in the algebra of the behavior of what's happening with this. So let's do a demographic of that. Let's do exponential we're going to do growth here, we're going to do constant here, and then we're going to do exponential decay right here. My OCD really wants it to say exponential in both cases, so, but all right. We're going to draw a picture. 
in each of the cases, I'm going to let A be positive. Except here. If A is positive and I do, well, we're just going to use the base E now. And if I look at the function y equals e to the ax, this always looks like this. Always. It doesn't matter what the value of a is. You could take a number. but A can now be between 0 and infinity. It doesn't matter. If you use 1 half, e to the 1 half x will still look like this. E to the 2x will still look like this. It'll, just, it'll have that same general shape. It'll just be growing faster. They all look like this. This is what we mean by exponential growth. It's growing over time. This is going to be our time axis now. As time progresses to infinity, time waits for nobody. Where does it go? I don't know. Somewhere. But as it does, it time waits for no model either. So what we're trying to say is as time progresses, our population, if this is modeling our population of our infection, which is going to do in our first few models, it says that our infected individual's population is going to grow exponentially. That seems like a bad thing when we say the infected population is growing exponentially. It's getting bigger and bigger, and it's getting bigger and bigger, faster and faster. Between this point and this point, and then the next point, do you see, we're going to compare that in the next one, but it's going to it keep growing. What does it mean, exponential growth? So this is growth. If it's A is 0, then I'm going to get Y is E to the 0X, which is... One, I get a constant function. We don't really talk about that. It doesn't, there's no change. What's that? The derivative of a constant is zero. There's no change in that function. What's the instantaneous rate of change of a function that never changes? No change. And what do we want if y is equal to e to the negative ax? Now that's why I made a positive. So think about if this was a 2. e to the negative 2x is always going to look like this. And then this is what we mean by exponential decay. And notice that in that case, it's always going to decay to 0. What that says is the limit as t approaches infinity of e to the negative at is equal to 0. This algebraic avatar is describing the geometric avatar that this function is has a horizontal asymptote, we call it, of zero at positive infinity. It's getting closer and closer, arbitrarily close to zero. That would be good in a model if the infected population starts here and then exponentially decays to zero. That's what we want. Oh, I just ruined the poster. Save. No, ruin smudge. This is exponential growth versus exponential decay. Now let's compare exponential growth and linear growth. If you don't compare the two, what's the big difference? All right, now let's compare exponential growth and linear growth. That's our independent variable. And then let's look at y equals 2t. For both of them, just plot points at first. If you don't know what a curve looks like, back to square one, how do you think we knew what a parabola looked like at u? We plot a point, some wizard at the way back, and then they showed everybody like, oh, it looks like a u, and then you remembered. So if I plot points at 0, at t equals 0, e to the t is going to be e to the 0, which is 1. At 1, we get e to the 1, which is approximately equal to 2.72. So I get this value at 1. Then what do I get? At 2, we'll just do a couple, three points is good enough. We get e squared, which is what? I don't know. This guy way up here. e squared. For this function, I do the same thing. 0, 1, 2. It doubles it. Hopefully we can do that. 2 times 2 is 4. 0, 2, 4. Plot those points. Now we can use a different color even. Now what am I going to get? At 0, it was 0. At 1, it was 2. And at 2, it was 1, 2, 3, 4.
now we gotta use Gauss's line of best fit. Least squares, did I do that right? It was easy to just do two points. A straight line is determined by two points. I should have just done two of them and this and then that. There, that's how you do that. Least squares, we just least square solution. You see that in a least square solution of that best line of best fit. Or just go to your home point. And then we have the exponential function. Oh, wait. That's how you make the curve go through points too. You just make those curves thicker. Notice that first of all, the exponential function, you can prove Lapital's rule of the limit as n approaches, uh, let's use x, as x approaches infinity of any polynomial of degree n of x over e to the x is zero. That says, this is a tug of war, Lapital's rule crash course, and what, what is this saying to me? What do these limits do when you make me do this? What that says is e dominates every polynomial. What does that mean by dominate? Eventually, you might have a polynomial that does this and is bigger than e at first, but eventually, way out there at infinity, e grows faster than every polynomial, including linear functions. He's In this function, he just never the linear function is never larger than this one, but it could be locally larger, but it says that e is trying to tug a war to zero, and this polynomial at infinity is trying to tug a war to infinity, and the limit is zero, it turns out. So E won the tug of war, which means E dominates every polynomial. He grows faster than every polynomial eventually. Every polynomial, including this polynomial, which is a linear function. What does that say? Also notice that in here, the distances between the image points is remaining constant. At every step, I have this. And what is that? Well, that is the distance is the, that distance is the square root of, in the first one, 2 minus 0, uh, 2 squared plus 1 squared, which is root 5. The distance here is all root 5. It's going to be another talk to 2.36. He is involved in the golden ratio. But all of these are root 5s, root 5, root 5. So as you go along in time, the distance between image points or the growth of the population is remaining constant or linear. In the exponentiation one, oh, we should see that one. How do you do that? So I just find the arc length of this curve by just computing the distance with the arc length of these curves. Oh my goodness, that's a hot, let's quickly do that too. Quickly, quickly. The problem is the question is always quick, is the solution would take a long time. I won't put the bounds on it, it'll go a little bit faster. What is the arc length of, well, we have to, from, of y equals e to the t. This is from 0 to 1. This is the integral from 0 to 1 of the square root of 1 plus dy dx or dt squared dt, which is the integral from 0 to 1 of the square root of 1 plus e to the 2t dt, which is let w equal e to the t, then dw equals e to the t dt, but I don't have that, I only have dt, so then, but he's w, so 1 over w dw equals dt, and then when t is 0, that says w is 1, and when t is 1, that says w is e, so this gives me the integral from uh, 1 to e of, <clears throat> what did I get? The square root of 1 plus w squared over w dw. Well, that looks an awful lot like a trigonometric substitution. I'm going to do, okay, let's do that. And we do that. Then this tells me that W is going to equal tan theta. And then that means that the square root of 1 plus W squared equals secant theta. And DW equals secant squared theta D theta. And when W equals 1, this says theta equals our tan of 1, which is pi over 4. And then when W equals E, we get theta is arctan of e. Ooh, that one's a nasty one. So that one becomes equals, ran out of space, I don't know, tangent, another pun intended, tangent, equals, this one becomes now the integral from pi over 4 to arctan of e of one of my favorite ones. This is going to become what? Secant squared theta times secant theta d theta. Oh, it might be not so bad. What do I get? Did I do that right? And now I sped it up. I got secant from that guy. DW gave me secant squared. And then I got over, ooh, over tan theta. 
Did I forget that in my first derivation? Now what do I do with that guy? Oh no. That gives me what? The integral from pi over 4 of arc 10 of e of this is 1 over cos cubed theta times 10 is cos theta over sine theta d theta, which is equal to the integral from pi over 4 to arc 10 of e of cancel cancel secant squared theta times cosecant theta d theta. Uh, how am I going to get myself out of that? I think we're going to dot 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 and let you finish. How am I going to get myself out? I'm going to use integration by parts. I'm going to let u equal cosecant theta, then du equals dot dot dot, and dv equals I can integrate the crap out of the integral of secant cubed secant squared theta d theta. That says v is equal to tan theta. Integration by parts, blah, 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 blah. Turns out, yeah, computing the arc length of E, you should also appreciate that wherever they're getting that information from, but that's what they were computing was the arc length of that guy. This, when you finish, I've got a mission. Do the calculation, tell me what the limit is below. Six, the Monode function. I'm pretty sure that's what it's called in the science. This comes up a lot and so it usually has a name. What this is, is an improper rational function is what this is. A degree one on the top, n times t is just, we just did a 2t. So n is a positive number. It's going to be the carrying capacity. And then b is going to be something it's going to be, we'll see when we do the models. We're going to get these. And that's why I'm prepping you to see how to analyze these functions. Yeah, this is a pre-calculus question. Again, stop trying to categorize where problems are. Oh, that's a grade two problem, adding fractions. Yeah, well, maybe try it out as a 20-year-old and as an adult. Maybe you'll relearn and it'll make a whole lot more sense than when you were in grade two and you were trying to add fractions. Don't try to age categorize problems. <laughs> but having said that, this is a pre-calculus problem. <laughs> so what we're going to do is I'm going to use a crash course, do a crash course in uh, long division of polynomials because this is an improper rational function which means the degree on the top is one and the degree on the bottom is one that means I can do long division and write it as a polynomial plus a proper rational function which is also good if I want to integrate the crap out of this thing and find the area under it I would have to use partial fraction decomposition and it's not ready we're not going to do that here what we're going to do is I'm going to use long division put it in a standard form see that it has been transformed how do I sketch this I don't want to plot points again and then what they teach you in pre-calculus and calculus and they say if you have a standard function one over t which is that guy but he's been had four things done to it i can't tell in this form because it's in improper form i'm going to do the long division to put it in a standard form and i can see that there was four transformations reflection about the x-axis vertical stretch by n shift to the left by b and up by n units how do I see that long division first? And then we're going to compare this guy to this guy and just move this one around. This one has an avatar, which you should know already, is 1 over x is the hyperbola. In the parabolic form, I wrote that as secant theta, x equals secant theta, and y equals tan theta, or theta between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And watch the other video on parametric equations, but in unparameterized form, this looks like this. In either way, it, its geometric avatar is this guy. What we're going to do is take that now and see what we've done to create this and then we're just get to move the graph and do the four things to this guy to create that guy that's what we're going to do long division first i'm dividing the function nt i'm dividing the function nt by t plus b so when you divide seven by three what do I do? I say, what do I have to multiply 3 by to not go over 7? And that's why it's a good idea to write the multiples of 3 first. And I see I'm going to multiply by 2. This is times 2. So I multiply by 2. I put it there. I write the outcome below. 3 times 2 is 6. I subtract. I get 1. 1 is less than 3. So I can stop. What does that tell me? That calculation tells me that 7 is equal to 2 times 3 plus 1. And then more importantly, when I divide them, 
I used some fraction laws, but seven over three then is two and one third cups. Seven thirds cups of flour is two and one third cup. And notice what I did with that is I used that process of long division of integers to write seven over three as a whole number plus a proper fraction, which means it's between zero and one. We're going to do the exact same thing with this. I'm going to write the polynomial. We're going to have a P of X, and then I'm going to divide it by B of X. And then I'm going to get a Q of X, and then we're going to get a dot, 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 we're going to get an R of X when the degree of R is less than the degree of B. We stop. And then I can write the polynomials. Once I have this, I can write this as p of x equals q of x times b of x plus r of x. And then when I want to divide by b, I divide by b, cancel, and I get by b. And then what I've got is a polynomial plus a proper rational function. And that's what we're about to do right here. There's a crash course in long division of polynomials. It's awfully similar to long division of regular numbers. How many, what do I have to multiply t by to get nt? It's not a trick question, n. And then I do that, I multiply n by this polynomial and I get nt plus nb. I put brackets to be careful, I subtract. These will cancel, and then I get careful. Zero minus this is negative nb. Now let's do that. What does that tell me? That tells me that nt is equal to n times t plus b minus nb. Of course it is. This is nb, and then this is positive nb minus nb. But now I've written it as p of x equals q of x times b of x plus the remainder. And now what do I do? Now let's divide it by t plus b. And that tells me by long division of polynomials, this function is actually equal to n, a constant, minus nb over t plus b, which is a proper rational function now. And now I can see what the four transformations I've done to this function. Let's clean that up a little bit more. This is actually equal to negative nb plus n is the way that you would want to see this. Now there's four things I do reflections first. One, first of all, star, my standard function, std <laughs> function, is f, no, I use f, h of t equals one over t. Then one, to transform this, to create the graph of this, I have done reflection about what? It's on the outside of y, so it's reflection. y is going to its negative. And where does that go across? The x-axis. So we have reflection about the x-axis. Two, this number, n and b. It's either vertical stretch or shrink. I can't tell. N is actually the carrying capacity, which will be extremely large, 10,000, and then B will be some number. This is probably a number larger than one, so it's actually a vertical stretch, I'm gonna guess, but it's vertical stretch or shrink. By NB. You'll see it's stretch, because I'm gonna make that a 10 in the one that I do. And then three. <clears throat> This is t plus b is, this gets everybody, this is t minus negative b. And where's negative b? It's on the left of zero. So you move left b units. Shift left. b is positive, but I'm going to go left b, and that's why minus minus is plus. And then what's the last thing we do? Up n units. Now we're using standard transformations to move this function, the reciprocal function one over t 
in the plane, what do I get? I get this. I'm going to speed up and I'll just put all these together. I do the reflection first, then the order doesn't matter. Remember, N is positive and B is positive. So I'm shifting to the left B unit. Also, just check what's F of zero. Zero. Got a point on my curve, good. <laughs> One. A few more to go. Infinity is an extremely long time, especially towards the end. Especially towards the end. It's really balanced. Then N is also positive and it's probably large because it's our carrying capacity it's going to turn out. And this isn't, again, the, the, quite the function that we're going to use, but what does this one look like now? What I had was this guy, first I'm reflecting it about the x-axis, so this one's going to do this, and this one's going to do this, we're going to get that next. In my mind, that's the reflection. Then I'm going to take that, and I'm going to shift the left B units up N units, and then it's vertically stretched, which you can't really see because it's an infinite unbounded function. So this is what we get. Who knew? When you take pre-calculus, you actually can use this for some meaningful derivations and analysis of the spread of infectious diseases. We're going to use these types of functions right away. The Monod function, this is what it looks like. How did I do it? I look, remember what standard functions look like. I remembered how to do standard transformations, and I used 1 over t and did four things to it to build the graph of this guy who's called the Monod function. Next. We're on the home stretch seven. I think I got one more eight, which is two cubed exponents. Right. Ocho and the two cubed. <laughs> Ocho's eight. I didn't remember that. <laughs> uh, I've had too much coffee. It's early. That's how you fight diseases. Keep your throat warm. A lot of whiskey, a lot of coffee. All right, seven. Now I'm going to do composition. You're like, well, you want to do that? Well, it turns out you want to see this when you get the solution to our functions. It turns out that in one of the models that I do, we get exactly this. So I'm going to prep you for it. What is the Monod function? I've got f of t equals uh, nt over t plus b. We're going to just keep it like that one in its general form, in its non-standard form, opened up for convenience. And I'm going to let g of t equal e to the n r t. Again, n is positive and r is positive and b is positive. What am I doing? Composition, hog off. Go watch hog off. What's hog off? Go watch the other videos on composition. I do hog off. What is f following g of t? Let's find out. This is equal to f of g of t by definition of composition f following g then we're going to do f what does f do i don't know yet it does this monode business first g is the exponential function e to the n r t what does f do f does n times t and t plus b and then it takes that fraction so what do I do? I put this thing wherever t was in the original expression, and we're going to get equals n times e to the n r t over e to the n r t plus b. This is going to be one of the solutions to the differential equation that I solve in the next video. So watch the next video and you will see in the first model that we do to model the spread of infectious diseases when I just consider one uh, population which is infected, we end up getting a function which looks an awful lot like, actually it looks like a slightly different function, but a couple of the cases that we get are going to look like this also. Just to see what this looks like now, I'm going to do something else, which we didn't, now it's going to be a calculus problem. What we're going to do is, this one now, I'm going to have, because we use composition, I can't just find the standard function and sketch and shift this. This is that function shifted in the plane, now composed with an exponential function. What the heck does that look like? I'm going to now switch to having more machinery once you take calculus. 
what do I want this for? I don't want to the definition of calculus to screw with first year students. That's not why Sir Isaac Newton derived the definition of calculus of variations. And that's not why I want to use it. But it's a good application, I guess, <laughs> messing with first year students. But it's not why we wanted to do it. This is an extremely useful application. Applications of derivatives. Do these. I'm going to use the first derivative and the second derivative to tell me the shape of this function. Here we go. I'm not going to use these horrible numbers because they're like, I don't want to see the carry on the derivative. And so we'll put numbers in there. Not today, Satan. Not today. We'll put numbers in there and all the letters will be gone except for E. E's a number, not a letter. 8, which is 2 to the 3. And then we're done. Sketch the function. I'll be mean and do it the way that the instructor will do it. The function f of t equals n e to the n r t over t plus b. I thought you said you put numbers in and not letters, Satan. Yeah, I will, just a second, where <laughs> I make you do it. n is 10, <laughs> b is 9, r is 1 over 10. So you can see, that's you think I'm being mean, but I'm trying to say match with the numbers to the letters mumbo jumbo so that Satan doesn't get you. I already sold it, so it's too late. Sorry. I didn't think I got this YouTube channel. What does that give me? My function, I want to sketch this function. F of t is 10, e to the 10 over 10, e to the t over, sorry. What was that? E to the N R T. Well, the Minode composition with that, what's going on? Mistakes will be made. Mistakes were made. E to the T plus 9. Either way, that's the function I wanted. What does that look like in the plane? Exactly. I don't know. And the move that they usually use in the books when you see this, and there's horrible numbers in here, this is I naught over S naught, and the blah, 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 blah. And then they write like this. How did I do this move? Can you see how I did it? Is it clearly, clearly, <laughs> clearly, <laughs> this is true. My favorite trick, first of all. I multiply by one in the form of e to the negative t over e to the negative t, and then they get this, and that's a little bit easier to analyze this way. Ah. I didn't even notice their clever trick and I did it this way, so I just thought I would show you that you can change the, what the avatar looks like. Equal. Use the dirty trick. Multiply by one. Actually, that's a whole lot easier to do when I do limits at infinity. Sketch this function. Let's write it at the top and then we'll sketch it. Sketching functions. Something calculus book uses bl blank, starts with an S and ends with Uwerch. Calculus <laughs> has these steps. A, what's A? Mark disagrees wholeheartedly. Solomonovich used to not be using those steps. It doesn't talk about symmetry and all these things around. Okay, for now, this will be close enough. A, find the domain. What's the domain of this function? Mantra one, do you have division by zero? Possibly, but e to the t is always positive, plus 9 is always positive, so no, no division by 0. Do I have any even nth roots? No. Do I have any logarithms? No. We're in business. Our three mantras now, we have a third mantra. When you have exponential functions, the third mantra is logs can't have negatives. I don't have any logs. So mantra 1, do I have any negatives under even nth roots? I don't have any even nth roots. Nothing. Do I have division by 0? Oh, I do have a fraction, but this thing I see is positive. E to the T was this guy, plus 9 is this guy, way the frick away from 0. Never 0. So, everything. I didn't have to kick anybody out of the party. Everybody gets to stay. The domain is R. B, X and Y intercepts. What's the X intercept? That's when Y is 0. When is Y 0? We just said never. So it doesn't cross the x-axis. It never interacts with the x-axis. When do I get a y-intercept? That's when t is zero. T-intercept. Oh, t. T-intercept, you know what I mean, if you've taken calculus. Well, that I can compute. 
guess what you're going to get? It has to be the, technically what I had was S0 was 9 and I0 was 1. And then so the 10 is 9 plus 1. And when I do this, it should simplify to the, if this is going to express the initial infected population at 0, it should give me the initial population, which is 1 of the infected. Let's see what happens. At t equals 0, I get f of 0 is 10 times e to the 0 over e to the 0 plus 9, which is 10 over 10, which is 1, which is the initial population of the infected secretly. <laughs> but 1, it does have an x-axis that where it intersects, the y-intercept is the initial population of the infected in our model. And we won't have a negative in the scenario. What's negative time? I don't know. That's the, you're going the wrong way. <laughs> How do you know where we're going? <laughs> <laughs> All right, next. B, so X and Y intercepts. Technically, why are you waiting? As soon as you have a point, also, don't do, wait till the, you do all the steps in H, he says in the calculus book. H, put that together and sketch. No, start H as soon as you can. I just found one. What does that say? I have a Y intercept when X is zero, Y is one. I have a point on my curve. Good. I, again, have infinitely many more to go, but I've got one. And then we're going to do, where are we going to go? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That's an awfully big 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Why do I know I need that? That's our carrying capacity. 10 was the total population, which is the carrying capacity. If you only have 10 people and they're going to get infected, how many infected could you possibly have at the end? At most 10, I'm going to guess. <laughs> which will, it will say in the model. So this is our 10 now. So I have a point on there. C, do I have symmetry with respect to the axes? You could have symmetry with respect to some other shifted axes, and this was what Mark is saying. They don't really tell you about all symmetry. Symmetry with respect to the axes. The function could still have symmetry, but not with respect to the axes. Whatever. I hear you, Mark. I hear you. One person cares. Do we have symmetry? How do I check symmetry? F of negative t, that's correct, is 10 e to the negative t over e to the negative t plus 9. That doesn't equal f. And that doesn't equal, I don't know what that says, it doesn't equal negative f t. None. None symmetry. D. Vertical asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes. How many vertical asymptotes do I have? None. The domain is r. Vertical asymptotes are possibly where I'm dividing by zero. I didn't have any division by zero. My domain was R. I have no vertical asymptotes. D, vertical asymptotes, none, because the domain is R. How, what do I write to justify that? This, the domain is R. There are no vertical asymptotes. If you know what you're talking about, the possible vertical asymptotes will come when I have division by zero, but that's never going to happen because I don't have division by zero. Horizontal asymptotes. Horizontal asymptotes. No HAs is what you want. No HAs. <laughs> or some. In our case, we want all HAs. You want horizontal asymptotes in this case, which we do have at a negative infinity and at positive infinity, and they're different. You can have at most two horizontal asymptotes, which means you could have zero, one, or two, at most two. In this case, we have two and they're different. What are those? The limit as t approaches negative infinity of, now I'm going to divide by the, b, 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 no, let's see, of f of t is 10 e to the t over e to the t plus 9. So now I'm going to negative infinity. That's a really crooked negative. And so what do I know about regular e to the t? At negative infinity, positive e's are 0. So I want to keep those. So this is equal to 0 over 0 plus 9, which is 0. Oh, that tells me this. I have a horizontal asymptote of 0. y equals 0 is a h a in the negative direction. What is it in the positive direction? In the positive direction, when I go to positive infinity, I know that e to the negative t goes to 0. So I want to get those guys, and then I'm going to multiply by the dirty trick and put it in its other form. The two different avatars... The first, this one that I gave it to you in the question, I gave it to myself. When the original function I gave myself, that avatar happened to be useful for the description at negative infinity. Now at positive infinity, I'm going to manipulate it to be convenient for the expression and what happens at positive infinity. It's not down here. It's up here. 
the limit as t approaches positive infinity of f of t. I'm going to multiply by e to the negative t and e to the negative t. I'll do it up here and then distribute it. What does that give me? Is 10 plus 1 plus 9 e to the negative t. And what does that give me? This goes to 0. So this gives me 10 over 1 plus 0, which is 10, the carrying capacity. So what does that tell me? That tells me those two calculations I'm erasing right now, those limits at infinity, tell me that we really usually write that as dash line there, dash, 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 dash. It tells me that now. And again, I don't wait till the end. That limit told me that I'm approaching 10 as I approach infinity, and then I'm approaching 0. I know it's a, from above here for sure because my function is never zero, negative and never interacts with the x-axis. So again, to recap, I found my x and y intercepts, I found I had no symmetry. You can see that because the behavior is even different in both ends. If it was symmetric, it would have the same behavior. It would have to come and do something symmetric, but it's not. We also found that its end behavior, we have a horizontal asymptote of 0 in this and 10 in this direction. Now we start using calculus. This is all sort of pre-calculus except for those limits. The first four steps are pre-calculus except for limits. I don't know if we're gonna do this in pre-calculus. Now I use the first derivative and second derivative to deal with the local behavior of all of the local maximums and bumps. I've dealt with infinity and I've dealt with where it interacts with the x-axis and I've dealt with symmetry. Now I'm gonna use, nail down what the first and second derivative are to find out what happens in here. What is the first derivative of this function? This is 10 e to the t, e to the t plus 9 to the minus 1 prime, which is equal to 10 e to the t. The derivative of this is itself times e to the t plus 9 to the minus 1. I leave this one alone. Plus, minus, I'm doing it in my head. What are we going to get? Minus 10 e to the t, e to the t plus 9 to the minus 2 times e to the t for the chain rule. Now what am I going to do? I'm going to factor out I have e to the t in both terms, I have 10 in both terms, and I have e to the t plus 9 to an exponent. So I can take out 10 e to the t. I can take out one of these and one of these, I take out the lowest exponent, I take out the negative 2. e to the t plus 9 to the negative 2, I made it positive by putting it to the denominator. What's left? In here I have e to the t plus 9 minus 1 minus minus 2 is e to the t plus 9 minus e to the t is all I have left in this one. Cancel, cancel. The first derivative, I already want to call it i. What does that say? Blah, 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 blah. The first derivative is 90 e to the t over e to the t plus 9 squared, which is what? Positive for all t. This is never negative. What does that tell me? Monotonically increasing, no local maximums. Who? F. What the first derivative tells me is this behavior. If the first derivative is positive, your function is increasing. If the first derivative is negative on an interval, you're decreasing. We just found for all our whole domain, all of R, which is my domain, my first derivative is positive. That means my function is increasing. That means I can now say this. It's increasing for all time. What's the last thing I need to know? I need to know I'm cheating, but it's right about there. Where's the inflection point? Where do I go from concave up to concave down? Let's find that switch in the critical tipping point. What do I do for that? The second derivative. What's the second derivative? Bah, the derivative of this, which is the derivative of f prime prime is the derivative of 90 e to the t times e to the t plus 9 to the negative 2. So that is equal to, again, the derivative of this is 90 e to the t. I leave e to the t plus 9 to the negative 2 alone. Then I leave 90 e to the t alone. And what do I get? 90 e to the t times negative 2. I move the negative to the front. 
e to the t plus 9 to the negative 3 e to the t again. What is that going to give me? Equals, again, I'm going to play the same trick. I have 90 e to the t in both, 90 e to the t. I have e to the t plus 9 to the sum power. So this is 90 e to the t over e to the t plus 9 cubed times what do I have left? e to the t plus 9 minus 2 e to the t. And this time you can see, cleaning that up, what does that give me? The first or second derivative is 90 e to the t, 9 minus e to the t over e to the t plus 9 cubed. This is the second derivative. When is this 0 or doesn't exist? This is equal to 0 if and only if the, the bottom is never 0, but even if it was, that wouldn't give me 0. That would give me doesn't exist, but that's never. When is it 0? This is never 0, so this has to be 0. If 9 minus e to the t equals 0, which says what? What you do to one side, you do to the other side. I'm going to subtract e to the t from both sides. That gives me 9 equals e to the t. What you do to one side, you do to the other. I'm going to log both sides. That gives me log of 9 equals t. Log of 9 is 2 times log 3, because 9 is 3 squared exponent log. I'll just leave it log 9. What is log 9? ln 9 is approximately equal to 2.1. I looked it up yesterday. <laughs> so, what does that say? <laughs> That's t. Then what do I have to say? I'm going to be lazy, but my first derivative of t is negative when ln t is, or ln 9 is larger than t and f prime prime, I'm being lazy, I'm skipping this step. You're supposed to use this to build your chart and find out when it's, okay, okay. Now I split that, I have negative infinity to log nine, log nine to infinity, and then I have e to the t minus nine, is that right? Nine minus e to the t, nine minus e to the t, and then the rest, f prime prime of t, and then f of t, what's gonna happen there? In here, when we get this, we're going to get positive, and then everything else is positive, so we're going to get the first derivative is positive, so we're going to get concave up, and then we're going to get negative, and then we're, so the second derivative will be negative in there, so then we'll get concave down. Because the domain is all the real numbers, the point ln9 is in the domain of f, which says that ln9 and f of ln9, what's f of ln9? <coughs> Put that in there, it's ln9, so the e and the ln will actually cancel, cancel, cancel it, you get 5. What does that give me? At ln9, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is my inflection point, ln9, 5. It has to be on the graph of this. What does that say? My function is concave up, my function is concave down. This is the sketch of that function. I used the first derivative test to find out local max and mins. In this case, there was none. It was monotonically increasing. I used the second derivative to find when it's concave up or concave down. And then I find where there's switches and points that are in my domain. And you switch concavity is called an inflection point. That's where I switch from being concave up to concave this is the curve to when I start analyzing this or when they show you on all these other YouTube videos when they're trying to do this. This is the analysis that we have to do behind the scenes to actually accurately get a picture of what's going on with these. Please subscribe below. In the next video, we will do more of these functions. We're more complicated for the prepping for some of the more baby bear, mama bear, papa bear type. These are the fetus videos, basically. We were gonna do mama bear, papa bear, uh, mama bear, baby bear, papa bear, one of those orders, that was a permutation, which permutation of them? What the correct order is baby bear, mama bear, papa bear was the order we were going to do of these models. And then I was prepping and I realized that we needed one before that and what comes before that? Fetus, fetus comes before that. <laughs> First comes love, then comes marriage, then a baby in the baby carriage. So we did these videos, there will be a couple more of these videos, and then we're also going to start a series on the Infectious Model series. Please subscribe below, hit the link, and I will see you next time.
We could even just make that an A if you want, but for simplicity, you're hour either way. What am I gonna do with this? Stop bumping the camera, I'm trying to do work here. <laughs> that was me doing it. <laughs> Finally, it wasn't the cats, I can't blame that on the cats, that's the cameraman, I don't know what he's doing over there. <laughs> he's trying to, don't, lean on the wall, not the, <laughs> uh, 